essential to support government agencies and manufacturers in their ongoing research and development of new medical tre treatments for opioid use disorder and overdose reversals. Education is always the first step in this vital work, and I'm grateful to be here on the Hill with fellow members of Congress and congressional staff to learn from these incredible Georgetown students on how to use Narcan and recognize the signs and symptoms of an opioid overdose. So I look forward to the continued leadership of the Bipartisan Mental Health and Substance Use Task Force and the Addiction Recovery and Treatment Caucus between now and the end of the year and of course in the Congress. And fewer people know this issue better and are more integral to these ongoing efforts than my friend and my colleague, Congresswoman Ricky Pedersen, who I'd like to invite you to have a seat. that 
um, I think it's important to voice those things during recovery month and throughout the year. But I have had a lot of people in my life that have not had the same journey, that have passed away, that, you know, and so recovery month is also an opportunity to celebrate the lives that, um, you know, have succeeded and have been on a healthier trajectory, but also to remember and honor those that we've lost uh, and to refocus our efforts on doing the things at a policy level, at a program level, but also at an individual level. And that's why naloxone training is so important. It is a tool that each of us can take away today and potentially save a life. It's just like CPR. It's just like the Heimlich Maneuver. It should become a standard part of what everybody knows to do to save a life. Um, and because of policy changes, because of funding that's out there, we've been able to significantly expand access to naloxone. You can go to a pharmacy and get an understanding order. You can go to a pharmacy and buy it over the counter. Um, so it is a tool that is accessible, but we need people who are trained and comfortable in using that tool to save a life. So uh, I think this is the opportunity for us to take that personal action and reflect our commitment to this issue while also working on the bigger issues. And SAMHSA has been working with states under our policy academies over the last year to really optimize funding and resources to saturate the communities with naloxone. We work with 26 states, D.C. and Puerto Rico, in a really intensive way, meeting with them on a regular basis, convening teams in the states, to really plot out where are those communities who are being left behind? How do we get more naloxone into communities? But at the end of the day, somebody needs to have the naloxone at the right place at the right time and know how to use it. And so events like this are critically important in advancing that individual level training to save a life but it's also a way to normalize naloxone, to have conversations about substance use and overdose, to not marginalize or keep those populations in the shadows. So it really is a way to continue to build support for this effort in addition to acquiring technical skills that can save a life. So really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Look forward uh, to the presentation and I'll turn it back to you. Thank you very much. So the major one that we're going to be focusing on today is fentanyl. 
So this is one that has been involved in the majority of the overdoses that have been seen, both in D.C. and nationally, so that is really one of the major ones that we want to focus on today. And then a couple more things about opioids. So opioids are a class of drugs. We're going to get into this more later, but their mechanism of action is important, and they're going to be binding to receptors in your brain to really get their effect, uh, have their effect on um, people. And then opioids, like I said, include fentanyl, and they do have legal medical use, um, and that is a major area that we do see it used um, in terms of pain relief um, for patients, and especially for terminal, terminally ill cancer patients. Uh, but they are also found in the illicit drug supply, which is what we're focusing on. And then opioids can be um, taken in a variety of ways, smoke, snort, injected, swallowed, or drink. That's also something that's just important to know. So opioids impact multiple body systems. Like I said, its medical use revolves around pain relief. That's why we see it used a lot for patients. Uh, one of the reasons that we see it used illicitly is because of the euphoric effect it has. And then other things, other side effects that we've seen, meiosis, sedation, slow and impaired movement, constipation, itching. So these seem like minor things, and especially um, in the short term, they can feel minor, but over time, with chronic use, it does worsen the effects, um, and we see worsening these effects over time. So the major one that we want to focus on is respiratory depression. So this is the one where it becomes a medical emergency, and this is what um, where we see issues and why we want to provide the loss of training. Because once you see respiratory depression, that's really where we need to be acting as soon as possible in order to save this person from overdosing. And then some similarities and differences between opioids. So, like I said before, all opioids are the same class of drugs. So that means that you're going to see similar effects of naloxone no matter what opioid it is. And then also in terms of things like tolerance and stuff, like you are also going to see similar effects across all um, the opioids in the class. And then they do come in different formulations and strains. So these bottles are supposed to show lethal doses of both heroin and fentanyl. And what we want to emphasize is that this dose is going to change per person. It depends on so many things like body composition, what other drugs are also acting in the system. But what we really want to emphasize here is we want to show how strong fentanyl is. So that is the lethal dose for fentanyl. And you can see how little it takes to put somebody in an overdose kind of situation. So again, that shows why um, this training is so important because a lot of people aren't aware that so little is able to have that effect on them. And then, like I said before, the long stop works to reverse overdoses caused by all opioids. So as long as it's an opioid, you are able to use the long stop. If it's another kind of drug, then that um, will not be on board. So getting a little bit into the epidemiology before we get into the actual training. So first, we're going to see my national statistics. 136 people die every day from an opioid overdose, and an overdose deaths involving somebody who is near the fall of 2018 and 2013. So overdose deaths have increased 30% nationally since 2019, um, and as you know, a large part of that was due to COVID. Uh, after COVID, we did see a, a large increase in overdose deaths, opioid usage, all of that. So that's especially why this training has become very important. So now going more into DC statistics, first starting out with some statistics that show people that were able to be saved in an overdose situation, um, and also was able to be administered in time. So these show the number of calls that were made, and it shows the fluctuations throughout the years, throughout the months, and over the end of the use, um, and people that were able to be saved. So as we've seen in the past, that especially in the summer months, as well as the beginning of months, we see an uptick in the people who are using opioids, um, so, and also we just want to emphasize that this is an undercount because as we know, not everybody calls it in when somebody is overdosing or when somebody is using opioids. So, definitely an undercount, which just shows how this, um, the, use, uh, the use and the calls change over the year. And then opioid overdose fatalities. So, these are people that were unfortunately not able to be saved, the loss was not administered in time to them. And what we really want to emphasize on this slide is that there's been a 46% increase between 2019 and 2020. And we know that isolation, stress, a lot of different things from the COVID pandemic were, what, were a major factor in this increase that we've seen. It's great to hear about the recent statistics, and hopefully by next year this can reflect some of the positive changes that we have seen and hopefully continue to decrease in the future. So, technically, 
very easy to use. Um, there are other formulations of it, some that are intramuscular. Um, you're not going to have to worry about those. Um, most of the time, if you're receiving those from other people, they need to be giving you the training. So we're just showing you how to use the intranasal kind. If you get another formulation from anyone, just make sure that you're um, being trained on how to use it. And so the nasal kit comes with two dose doses in each box. No needles, no assembly required. It can be disposed of in a regular garbage can use. So again, very easy to use. Um, and with that, we're going to pass it on to Savannah. And she's going to get into how to identify it.
making, as we mentioned, is depressed respiration, which means they're having trouble breathing on their own. They're not taking good food as they're not making the appropriate amount of oxygen. So what we want to do is to help them breathe. We want to help them get oxygen into their lungs. So as you can see on the diagram, we're going to push the nose closed because we don't want the air coming out of it. We're going to do this jaw crust that I kind of talked about. We're going to tilt the head back to the front of the airway, and then your mouth can be there or there on the top And you want to do two breaths about every five seconds. Now, you can tell them about their RC or facial breathing, where you get them on hands on and things like that, where you can put them up to kind of help protect you, because obviously there are concerns of does this person have infection? Did they take the opiate orally? Is there still like opiate? Only perform rest breathing if you're having trouble breathing on whether or not If someone is unconscious but still able to breathe, they don't need to push more air into their lungs. The other thing that's very, very important is this is a respiratory-driven problem. So it's their lungs, it's not their heart. During your initial assessment, it's a great idea to check for a pulse, though, um, just to make sure that that's not the primary issue on the air. But please do not do CPR as much as possible. You can do far more damage than you could do with CPR as much as possible. If you're doing CPR correctly, you're going to break your ribs and you're going to bruise the body, So please just be aware as to what you're doing before you start doing that. So, the recovery position, highly recommended um, if they're not conscious enough to like, sit up and converse with you and things like that. After you administer the Narcan, you kind of start like, you sit and come around a little bit. Putting them on their side of this position where bottom arm is out underneath their head and top leg is at a 90 degree angle pulled over like this. This is a really great position to have them because it puts them on their side so they do start going, they go to the draws, it's going to come out and not come back down their way. And it also prevents them from rolling over flat on their
So as was previously mentioned, when you give somebody naloxone, you are essentially punching them into active withdrawal, and this is a very unpleasant, uncomfortable experience. Some side effects like necessarily chills, dizziness, fever, headache, nausea, rapid heartbeat, sweating, vomiting. Very uncomfortable, but ultimately temporary. And I would also like to mention that the side effects of naloxone are just the best experience to see that There are also no harmful side effects if you know what you're taking. For example, I am not actively in an opioid overdose right now. If I were to not kill myself right now, nothing would happen to me. Similarly, if you encounter somebody in a situation where you think that they are uh, in an overdose situation due to opioids, and it turns out that it was due to another substance or that they weren't actually in that situation, it's better to be safe than sorry because it is very hard to them to not hurt them in that situation. Because again, it belongs to the side of action. Can you give Narcan to a pregnant person? Yes. Can you give Narcan to somebody who is under the age of 18? Yes. Are there significant contraindications for taking Narcan? Only if the person has a documented allergy to naloxone. Those are some of the common questions that we get regarding stipulations about Narcan usage, etc. Most people don't remember overdosing. After they come out of overdose, they may be scared, overwhelmed, ill. They might be very agitated. They might get with you or even aggressive with you. Overall, it's a very stressful experience, both for the person who has acted to counteract the overdose and the person who is coming out of the overdose. Here's some resources we'd like to direct you to that provide mental health care support and drug treatment resources in case you're in those. And I'll also remember that regardless of this person's reaction to um, you know, what you've done, you can that the distribution of your numbers from the Department of Behavioral Health has about a two-year shelf life. However, we always say using expired Narcan is better than using no Narcan. There is not going to be anything harmful done to the person who overdose if you use expired Narcan on them, which just might be less effective. You can also dispose the introducing form of Narcan that the professor has done right now in the regular garbage. You can use the intramuscular form that has a no or sharp container. And if you'd rather not dispose of your expired Narcan, it's unused, you don't need to. Just a 
more about the discrimination that I was talking about in regards to kind of the distribution program. We were allowed to treat all of the community members. And if anyone has any questions, just feel free to ask us in the comments. So that is all the information that we have for you today. We ask that you please apply your phone to the post-test by the health department of behavioral health. It's a meeting with certification and attendance training. It can reverse the effects of the fentanyl. 
Now, there's a lot of research being done right now to try to come up with a vaccine, and thank God that's being done. We hope that is successful. We need it as soon as possible. But right now, we've got an opportunity to save lives by using a lot of by having it available. So I want to thank y'all for being here. I want to thank you for your interest in this. You wouldn't be here if you didn't care. You wouldn't be here right now if you didn't care about this situation. And this is an epidemic in our country. This is something we've got to address. Again, I applaud the FDA for what they've done in making this available. No excuse anymore for people not to have it. You can get it without a prescription. I applaud them for doing that. We need to get the strength to increase, and we will. We'll work on that, and we'll get that done. But at the same time, we've got it now. We've got a tool in our tool chest that we can use that will help us to save lives. 200 people every day. There is no excuse for that. You know, if we had a plane crash today and it killed 200 people, we'd stop every airline that was flying, every airplane that was flying until we figured out what went wrong. And yet we lose 200 people every day to fentanyl poisoning. We've got to stop this. So again, I want to thank y'all for being here. I want to thank you for having me. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for your interest in this. This is extremely important. It's important to our public health. Thank y'all. Uh, and last but not least, I want to introduce Congressman Paul Conn of New York. Congressman Paul is the co-chair of the Addiction Treatment and Recovery Office and one of the most outspoken advocates. You're a capital bill on this issue, so I'll let you close this down. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. And uh, certainly, I know that we've heard from many people today, and I appreciate everyone participating in what I think is a very important uh, awareness effort. Um, thank you, Captain Chris Jones, for uh, your service as director at the Center for Substance Abuse Prevention at SAMHSA. Thank you for being here to, to underscore the importance of the issue. I know that you've heard from my colleagues, uh, Congress members, Trahan Peterson, and just recently with uh, Representative Carter, um, and I thank them for uh, sharing their thoughts with us today. And let me thank you just for your partnership with so many of the efforts and the events that we host as an ATR caucus. It's much appreciated, so thank you for your leadership and your, your assistance uh, and all measures. Um, and on behalf of the caucus, the uh, Congressional Addiction Treatment and Recovery Caucus, let me thank each and every participant because without that participation, don't reach the young goals for which we're aiming. Um, as the representative of the uh, 20th Congressional District in New York, I would reinforce what uh, my colleague, uh, Congressman Carter, offered. We do hear, I do hear from parents, routinely, family members, friends about uh, purchases that were made in the street, innocent purchases that uh, were laced with fentanyl. And so let me reinforce that message and repeat it. The redundancy is much worth it, uh, do not purchase from the street. Uh, I'm, a, I'm proud to be a longtime champion for access to addiction treatment and reducing stigma around addiction. Uh, as Libby indicated, I chair the uh, caucus, the ATR caucus, along with my uh, colleague David Joyce, and our vice chairs are Dean and Chavez de Riva. But um, I thank you to uh, my friends at the task force for this great partnership in hosting what I believe is a meaningful training effort. Thank you to the Global Health Advocacy Incubator. Uh, in Congress, I'm proud to have uh, worked to better the lives of those struggling with the disease, with the illness of addiction. We must invest in treatment and recovery services and help prevent future loss of life. We need smart policies that allow for access to treatment. One important part of that equation is access to training in that lock zone. These trainings can make a big difference, a difference between life and death. This is a loss that many of us know too well. The loss of family members, certainly of uh, neighbors, uh, dying much too young and leaving behind a grieving family. Communities are being ripped apart by poison seemingly beyond our control. These trainings help us take back a small piece of control with the goal of, the, the lofty goal of saving lives. I'm encouraged by the recent decline in overdose deaths. And I believe that trainings like this, coupled with reducing stigma and access to naloxone are part of the reason for the decline. We have so much more work to do. We can have to come to place it even with improving statistics. I'm encouraged that so many people are here today with an open mind to learn and spread the word. 
I encourage everyone here today to do trainings like this in every district across the nation. To the Georgetown Drug Overdose Prevention and Education or DOPA Project, let me say thank you for this outstanding service to our congressional community. Thank you to all who led us in the uh, discussion and in the information exchange. And to everyone, thank you for joining us. And let us continue to spread this education and let's continue to save lives. So with that, let's go forward. There's a lot of work to do. Roll up our sleeves, get it done. But it begins with uh, determination. And I think we all have that here. Thank you. Let me give a shout out to Emily. Emily, you know, some of her who's done a lot of work uh, with the networking with the community. And I appreciate that. And Rachel, thank you for getting the word out via the communication, which uh, Rachel Pachin does for our office. So thank you one and all. And